Um, as we get started, I need you to, to use your imagination and imagine that there, imagine that there's a virus that has been brought into the local church. And uh, right away, as this virus is brought in, imagine the virus begins to spread. And uh, f- for some people, this, this virus ruins their faith. That was the situation that was going on when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. It was around the year 64 uh, in the church at Ephesus, and there were two men named uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and these two men started spreading a virus in the church that was leading people to fall away from the faith. And so the Apostle Paul here in chapter 2, verse 14, he begins to tell Timothy, the pastor, how he must defend against this virus. And what Paul says here is, extremely relevant for us because this virus that threatened the church way back in the year 64 still threatens the church today. It is a virus of words. And I want you to see this in the text. Uh, Look first at verse 14. See that phrase there, quarrel about words. That, That simply is the word, it just means word fight. That's the word Paul says, don't word fight. In verse 16, he says, avoid irreverent babble. Then in verse 17, uh, this irreverent babble is called their talk, or literally it's their word, their logos, or their word will spread like gangrene. Verse 18, we see these two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus, have swerved from the truth, but in what way? How have they swerved or deviated from the truth? It was by saying something untrue about the resurrection. So the problem that Timothy is facing here is the problem of false teaching, which carries the idea of word fighting or irreverent babble, or it's a a virus of words. False teaching is a word virus. And we can see here in 2 Timothy 2 that this word virus had a particular manifestation. But throughout the last 2,000 years of church history, the word virus has featured all kinds of different content. And therefore, Paul's exhortation to Timothy still applies to us today. Our context of redemptive history is the same. It's the same as Timothy's. The, The church in this world will always face the problem of false teaching, and false teaching will always lead to apostasy. And so we need to learn from the Apostle Paul in this passage. Paul is speaking to Timothy the pastor, but there are here at least three lessons that are relevant for all of us, and these are three lessons for all of us that will protect us from false teaching, and thus they will guard us against apostasy. Three lessons that will protect you from false teaching, guard you against apostasy. In other words, these are lessons that will help us endure in faith. All right? This is very much so a a how-to sermon. All right? So let's pray again, and we're going to jump right in here with number one. Uh, Father, again, with the distractions there, I want to just stop and ask for your help and for your kindness by the power of your Spirit. I pray that in this moment, as we open your word together, that you would send your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have these three lessons, these three how-tos. And here's the first. Number one, endure in faith by having a radical Godward orientation. Okay, we see this in verses 14 and 15. Verse 14, Paul here is picking back up what he has been saying back in verse 2. The them in verse 14 um, are the faithful men that we saw in verse 2 who Timothy is supposed to instruct in Paul's example. Timothy is supposed to remind these faithful men what Paul has said. He's to charge these faithful men before God not to word fight because squabbling over words does no good. It only ruins the hearers. And the hearers that are mentioned here in verse 14 are the others that are mentioned back in verse 2. These are the faithful men that, that these are the people, the, the, the others that the faithful men are supposed to teach. And so what Paul is doing here is he's still instructing Timothy on how to train pastors who will teach 
others. But then in verse 15, we see Paul focuses back on Timothy himself. Verse 15, he's saying, you, Timothy, now you, remember, Timothy, you've got to keep watch on yourself. When it comes to yourself, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, what does that mean? This is not an easy verse, okay? If you grew up in Awanas or something like that, you've heard this verse before, approved workmen are not ashamed. This is not an easy verse, though, okay? Because it, it, it can sound like, it might sound like, if we've been tracking with what Paul's saying here in 2 Timothy, th- this could be a contradiction to what he said in chapter 1. Okay, listen carefully here. Chapter 1, verse 9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Chapter 2, verse 15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. And so we have to ask, which is it? Are we we saved by grace? Or are we approved by doing our best? You see that? The The answer is both, because Paul is talking about two different things here. And, and, and the two different things that he's talking about brings us into a larger topic that we need to spend a little time on, okay? And this is the topic of what it means to please God, pleasing God, okay? And this is not a simple topic, so I need you to, to hang in there for a minute, okay? Hang with me here as we look at this. First, this. first things first, to be super clear, we are saved by grace and grace alone. Everyone is spiritually dead and can do nothing until the Holy Spirit comes and gives us life to believe the gospel and he unites us to Jesus where we become adopted sons and daughters of God. That is by grace. It's all by grace. You can never earn it. That is a gift that you can only receive. Okay, that's salvation. All right. It's by grace. And that's one thing. Okay? But then uh, another thing is that when you receive salvation, when, when, when you are saved, you are brought into a new relationship with God as your Father. And in that relationship, it becomes possible for you to please God. And so the, the being approved here before God, the being approved here in verse 15, does not mean to be justified. It does not mean to be saved. It does not mean to be loved by God. Paul is talking about what is pleasing to God. He's talking about how we please God. Now look, pleasing God does not make you more God's child. You you don't become more saved by pleasing God. But pleasing God, it is pleasing God. You can please God. As a son or daughter of God, you can do certain things or not do certain things that bring delight to the heart of God. Which means that the the idea that God always relates to all his children in all the same ways despite what they do is not true. Yes, you... If if you trust in Jesus, you're saved. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are united to Jesus by faith. And God looks at you, if you are united to Jesus, God looks at you as one of his children. But that does not mean that he looks at all of his children in the exact same ways all the time. That, That way of thinking is a kind of unbiblical equality that actually undermines the very notion of real relationship. For example, I love all eight of my children. All eight of them. I love all eight of my children because they are my children. And yet when I give them something to drink, for some of them, I make sure the cup has a lid on it. 
I, I relate to each of my children differently. Sometimes in a matter of minutes, I can speak sternly with one child, then I can belly laugh with another, and both of those actions flow from a heart of love for them as my children. They're both my children who I love to death. The, the family part never changes. The love is there. The love is there. And because we're real persons in real relationship, there is the possibility of different dynamics that will cause me to relate accordingly out of my love. Parents know what I mean here. And so, Christian, it's important that we get this. You need to know that you're in the family. Okay? If you're in Christ, you're in the family. That never changes. The love is there. You are a son or daughter of God. And as a son or daughter of God, you can bring joy to the heart of your father. And if you bring joy to his heart, he will relate differently to you than if you did not bring joy to his heart. That's what it means to please God. It is possible for you to please Him. And because that's true, be, because it's, it's possible for us to actually please God, it's possible for us to actually please our Father in heaven, we as Christians should be eager to please Him. The, the word here for do your best in verse 15 is the word to be eager it means this is something you're putting your energy toward. You're thinking about it. You're meaning to do it. You really desire to please God. You desire to stand before God, your Father in heaven, and to make him proud, as it were. You want to do that. Now, as I say these things, I wonder, like, I wonder what you think when you hear this. For some of us, what I'm saying it might sound like a burden to you. And, and maybe, maybe you, you want to push back and you want to say something like, no, God is always pleased with me. God is always pleased with all of his children all the time. And, that's, and, you, and you feel that pushback in your heart. And if you have something like that going on, okay, if you have something like that going on, it's probably because you are confusing the opportunity to please God as an attempt to earn his love. They're different. Okay? If you think of pleasing God as trying to earn God's love, of course that's going to feel like a burden. Trying to earn God's love is a burden, and it's also impossible. You can't. You cannot earn his love. He loves you by grace. Okay, That's the unchanging reality. Know that. Get that. Rest in that. Rest in that unchanging reality of God's steadfast, unmerited love for you. Rest in that. And then, grounded in that unchanging reality of God's love, know that this opportunity to please God, the the actual possibility of bringing delight to the heart of God, it presents to us a whole new way to live. And this new way to live is a radical reorientation to what we're used to because most of us, most of the time, we only think about pleasing ourselves and others. Just think about that. This is a moment to examine our hearts. When is the last time we were in a situation and we thought to ourselves, I just want to please God. Maybe you didn't know you could. Maybe you didn't know that was possible. But how often do we think this way? Because in every situation, here's the thing, we're always trying to please somebody, okay? And, and it's who you want to please that actually shapes what you believe and how you behave. Who you're trying to please has an amazing shaping effect on you. So this is no secret here. Just This is no, no secret here. The first step toward apostasy, the first step toward falling away, happens when you start caring more about pleasing people than you do pleasing God. And so we, we need this radical reorientation. 
We need this radical reorientation toward God that will defend us against apostasy. It means we want to live every day before and unto God's face. We want to think about Him. We want to look to Him. We want to be eager to please Him. We endure in faith by having a radical Godward orientation. It's not simple, but we need a radical Godward orientation. Number two here, we endure in faith by skillfully understanding the gospel. Okay, so Paul tells Timothy to be eager here to stand before God as one approved. Be eager to please God. And then he explains more of, of, of who this someone is, this approved one, this God pleaser, is an unashamed worker. Okay, and this idea, this image of, an, of a worker is one who labors. All right, so think about a blue collar, hands dirty, sweat, sweat drenched worker who is unashamed. Okay, I think about my dad. Okay, imagine that. This, this, this worker is unashamed, which means he's a worker who takes confidence in his work. He takes confidence in his work, rightly handling the word of truth. There's a connection here that we might miss in the English translation. Because in the Greek, the word there for rightly handle is the word ortho tomeo. And it means literally to cut straight. And this idea, this image of cutting straight, it fits with this worker imagery, Right? The worker, this worker is one who is not ashamed, but who takes confidence in his work. He's a skilled worker who cuts straight the word of truth. And the phrase here, word of truth, is one that Paul uses elsewhere in his letters. And it's really clear in those places that Paul is talking about the gospel. Okay, Because in Colossians 1, verse 5, he says the word of truth, the gospel. Same thing in Ephesians 1.13. So I, I think that's what he means here too. He's talking about the gospel, the whole message of Jesus in accordance with the scriptures. It's important now that we know this is the gospel that he's talking about. But the gospel here does not mean something different than the Bible. We, we only know the gospel, we only learn the gospel from the Bible. And so for us to devote ourselves to skillfully understanding the gospel, it is to devote ourselves to the Bible. And again, this is really practical for pastoral ministry because this is crucial to the calling of pastors. But this still applies to every Christian in that our knowledge of the gospel is a means for our endurance. And we, we see this especially when we look at the contrast here in the passage. So just look at this. There, there are really two different words that are going on here. In verse 15, there's that phrase, the word of truth. And in verse 17, there's the phrase, their talk, or this word, their word, their logos, will spread like gain green. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail when it comes to gangrene, you can Google it, but be careful, okay? But, but basically, what, what, what it is, is, is this, it's basically decomposing tissue within your body, okay? It's basically death in your body that spreads through your body as a bacterial infection. It's an incredible image for false teaching in the church. It's a brilliant image that Paul is using here. False teaching is a word virus, it's a word virus, and it spreads. And so Timothy is, is to be skilled in the word of truth, but he's to avoid this word virus because as this word virus spreads, as this false teaching spreads throughout the church, it leads to more and more ungodliness. And the situation that he explains here has to do with Hymenaeus and Philetus. They're the ones who have deviated from the truth. They're the ones who are spreading this word virus. And in verse 18, we see that it has to do with the resurrection. They were telling people, apparently, that the resurrection had already happened, by which they meant that the end time, future resurrection of believers had already happened. Now, we don't know the full details of this heresy. Um, we don't know the, the, the types of ungodliness that it led to. But there is enough in the passages compared to 1 Corinthians that we can, we can speculate, I think, decently what was going on here. The cultural air that surrounded the church in Ephesus was Greek. And within the ancient Greek worldview, there was a pretty stark dualism between the spiritual and the physical. The spiritual was good, the physical not so much. And so in that context, you have these two guys who are saying that the resurrection of believers had already happened. They were most likely saying that the resurrection was only spiritual. 
The spiritual resurrection of believers had already happened. And, and at one level, okay, that, 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 that's true. The, the, the spiritual part of people get resurrected by faith in Jesus, that they might say. And then, I want to get that. The, the, uh, the spiritual resurrection of people have already, has already happened. The spiritual part of people is resurrected by Jesus, they would say. And then you, you would become, if you're spiritually resurrected, you become a new person spiritually. That's good and true. Again, that's good and true. But the problem is they would add to that, and that's all there is. All there is is a spiritual resurrection. The spiritual resurrection has already happened. It's only spiritual. There is no final future resurrection of our bodies. Again, because the spirit is good and the physical is not. The physical is unredeemable. And so this separates the spirit and the body. And if these two are entirely separate and neither have any bearing on the other, you can imagine how this might justify certain sins of the body. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is teaching a theology of the body probably the same context here, this kind of error. We don't know the details. Something probably like this, but whatever it was, this was messing people up. It was destroying people's faith. And ungodliness was the symptom, which makes sense because sick sick doctrine leads to sick behavior. And in some cases, people even look for the unhealthy doctrine to support unhealthy behavior. Okay. Don't, don't think that the hook of false teaching is mainly intellectual. It's not. There are all kinds of intellectual sidesteps to Orthodox Christianity that are really just cover-ups for sin. And the greatest example in our day has to do with sexuality. There are some people in some groups who have tried to completely revise historic Christian sexual ethics. And what do you think drives that? It's not that these people have been pouring themselves into understanding the meaning of the Bible and they really just wanted to please God and be faithful. And somehow in that process, they discovered that Christians have gotten it wrong for two millennia. That's not well, everybody knows that's not what's going on there. It starts with sinful behavior, sinful actions, and then you have to go backwards and do an exegetical hack job to try to support those actions. But if we can cut straight the word of truth, if, if we can skillfully understand the gospel, then we can spot word viruses from a mile away, and we can avoid them like Paul says here. This is one of the ways that we persevere in faith. We endure in faith by skillfully understanding the gospel. Number three, final point here, we endure in faith by remembering the church will endure. We see this in verse 19. Now, when we get to verse 19, Paul is anticipating a question. If if this word virus, imagine we're reading this, we're asking him, Paul, okay, look, if this word virus is spreading throughout the church and it's ruining the faith of some, what if the some become many? And what if the many become all? What is going to keep this false teaching from completely taking over the church and destroying the whole thing? That's, that's, that's the question. That's an important question, and Paul has an answer. He starts here in verse 19. There's a conjunction there. It's the word but or the word nevertheless. Paul's saying, hey, although this word virus is spreading and the faith of some is being ruined, God's firm foundation stands. And the mention here of God's firm foundation is referring to an image of the church, okay? The church is going to endure. The foundation of the church is unshakable, is firm and solid, and it has a seal written on it. There's an inscription on the foundation. Okay, have you guys ever written before in wet concrete? You guys know what I'm talking about? The concrete's wet, you grab a stick, you kind of, you know, something. I remember as a kid, my dad one time, um, I was probably nine or 10, he uh, built a barn in our backyard. And uh, we called it the baseball barn because we put all of our baseball equipment in it and stuff like that. He built this barn, and he laid a concrete foundation for it. I remember the day he, he, he poured the concrete because he called, he called my, my sister and my brother and me 
He called us over and he said, hey, you guys can write here in the concrete while it's still wet. So I grabbed a stick. I'm again, nine or 10 years old. And I wrote in large, all caps, baseball is life. (laughs) And if you were to visit today, if you were to visit my parents today, you can go to that same spot right by where the dogs used to be. And you can bend down on that concrete. You can take the palm of your hand and you can smooth away all the dirt and debris and and you can still see it right there. It's inscribed right there. Now imagine that the church has a physical foundation. Imagine the church as as a building. You can imagine this building. That's that's Paul's image. It's the image that he uses. Imagine a building like this that has a foundation. Now imagine you're able to crawl your way down to its foundation, okay? You're under here, you're crawling your way down to the foundation. And when you get there, you find the foundation and you think, wow, this is firm. This is solid. And this is old. This foundation is like 1,987 years old. And you're looking at the foundation and you see there's an inscription written on it. So you take the palm of your hand and you smooth away all the dirt and the debris. And you can read it. You can read the inscription on this foundation. And you realize this inscription is actually truth. These are two truths about the church that the entire structure has been built upon. These are two truths that are here meant to be confidence for us that the church is going to last. The church is going to endure. What does the inscription say? Well, you look and you read, the Lord knows who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That's what it says. That's what the inscription says. And this inscription that you're you're reading is actually a combination of of quotes from the Old Testament. Most of it comes from one story in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 16. This is the story of Korah's rebellion. And now we don't know exactly to what degree Paul had this story in mind, but there's, it's very interesting. Okay, here, here, here's the story. It takes place after the Exodus. Korah is the great grandson of Levi, and he forms a faction of men within Israel who oppose Moses. And they all come, this faction comes to Moses, and they contest his leadership. They say, hey, Moses, we're all holy it's not right that you get to be the leader. And so Moses then says to Korah and to all this men, Moses says to this faction, he says, in the morning the Lord will show who is his. And in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the phrase reads this way. This is the translation that Paul read. The, tr- the, the phrase goes, the Lord knows those who are his. Numbers 16.5. That's what Paul's quoting here in 2 Timothy 2. So back in the story, we skip ahead to the next morning, and Korah and this faction, and then Moses and the whole congregation, they come together in the morning, and God sees them all, and God is ready to wipe everybody out. But Moses, he intercedes, he prays, he asks God, please don't destroy the whole people because of the one faction. Don't destroy everybody because of the one faction. And God says, okay, but everyone needs to get away from Korah and this faction. And so then Moses says to everybody, depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men. And the wording there, the idea is the same thing we see here in verse 19. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in the story, the congregation hears what Moses says, and so they separate from Korah and the faction. They avoid, they depart, they socially distance themselves from Korah and this faction. And when they do, the ground opens up and it swallows Korah, it swallows the faction, and they all die. But those who distanced themselves, those who avoided, those who separated themselves from Korah and the faction, they live. Now, we know that Paul has this in mind because he's quoting it here. We don't know exactly to what degree he has this in mind, but Paul is thinking about this. There was false teaching. There was a word virus in the church at Ephesus, and it was spreading, and it had the potential to wipe out the entire church. But how do we know it won't? How, how do we know that the church will make it through? Well, it's because God knows his people. He knows his people. And his people are set apart. First here, there's the hidden knowledge of God. God is not outsmarted by apostasy. God is never wringing his hands with worry that the whole church is going to fall away because God knows his people. He knows his people. Get this. 
God's knowledge of his people, which is hidden from us, is shown to us through the behavior of his people. And and both of these together form our confidence. God has a people. He has a people. And and you can recognize his people by how they live. That's what Paul's saying here. The, The plague of this word virus is going to be stopped. The church is going to make it, just like the church is always going to make it. And you, Christian, you, Christian, as a member of the church, you are going to make it too. You will make it, in part, by remembering that the church will make it. Remember the church will endure for your own endurance. Remember that it's good, it is good to be on the winning team, which is the church. You can tell everybody that. You can let it be known. Not the left, not the right. It's the church. The church is the winning team. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is going to make it through. And you, Christian, you are going to make it through because ultimately our confidence is not the means that God will use to keep us, but it is God himself in the work of Christ. Christ, Christ, the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. It will, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has come to this earth to live in your place. He took all of your sins and guilt and shame and the punishment you deserved. And on the cross, he died for you, church member. Christian, he died for you. He was dead and buried for you. And then on the third day, he was raised for you. He defeated death for you. He ascended to heaven for you. He sent his Holy Spirit for you. And now by faith in him, by receiving what he has done, we are forgiven and we are saved and we're going to make it. And in this moment, as we come to this table, we remember that. And we give him thanks. We give Jesus thanks. So the band can go ahead and come and the pastors can get ready to prepare the table. And I just want to say first, if you're here listening in the sanctuary or outside or if you're watching from the live stream, the first, I want, I want to invite you. If, if you have not trusted in Jesus, trust him. Right now, turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus. Do that right now. And if you have trusted in Jesus, if you are united to Jesus by faith, let us take confidence in his death and resurrection. Let us take confidence in the firm foundation of his church. Let us rejoice in his love and give him praise even now as we receive the bread and the cup. The pastors will come serve you. The body of Jesus is the true bread. The blood of Jesus is the true drink. Let us serve you.